everybody and welcome back to the Mini MOOC. I'm delighted that you've come back to join us again. And today we've got a very interesting keynote address from Alan Mulvey, who's Community Centre Liaison Officer for Aberdeen City Council. Alan has been involved with community organisations supporting community ownership and community empowerment for over 20 years in a number of different capacities. Today he's going to talk about community centres and what is community empowerment, how Aberdeen City Council are trying to achieve this as a service and how it is being perceived as well as are they actually empowering the community. So I'll hand over now to Alan to tell us all about it. Sorry, technology there for getting to switch myself on. <laughs> My name's Alan Mulvey, as Karen said. I'm the City Council's Community Centre Liaison Officer. Um, my previous roles within the, the Council, my last two roles, were Community Economic Development, which was about establishing community enterprises to deal with um, the services that local communities required, and um, Neighbourhood Community Planning, which was about bringing services together to respond to local communities' needs. Um, but what I'm wanting to talk about today is about the recent developments in the community centres across the city and how the council is trying to use that um, to empower local communities. One of the first things, Phil, if you can move on to the next slide, please, is what do we actually mean by um, community empowerment? Well, there is a, a formal definition which is available on the Scottish Government website. So the Scottish Government and COSLA, they've agreed the following definition. Community empowerment is a process where people work together um, to make change happen in their communities by having more power and influence over what matters to them. That's fairly straight cut and as it were, is the official definition. Sorry about that. Now, what I'd like to do is say, is this what's actually happening in community centres? Um, so if we go into the, the next slide. Well, what's actually happening with um, the community centres? The management committees that are running the activities and managing these buildings are be given the opportunity to manage them themselves directly and independently from the council. That's quite clearly people working together um, because the management committees are not individuals but are actually groups of um, local people. Um, they obviously have full control over the activities that are taking place within the community centres. So once again, they have the ability to change the activities that are taking place and respond to the local community's needs. And therefore, they should have full power and influence over what's happened in the community centres. So really, from um, taking the formal um, description of what community empowerment is, it's quite clear that the, what's happening within the community centres is on paper is about in community empowerment and giving the control of operating these centres to meet local needs to the communities themselves. We're also looking at this in an angle of um, community asset transfer and while the community groups themselves aren't actually given full ownership of the buildings, um, I think one of the reasons why that's not happened is purely because the deal that the council is actually giving the centres is quite good to be perfectly honest, as well as allowing them um, use of the community centre buildings for a, a nominal rent of um, £1 a year if asked. We also provide a, a development grant of approximately £10,500. We pay certain bills, the main ones of which are the, the heat and light bills, which can um, amount to quite a lot for a large building. And while there are um, some repairs which we would expect the, the occupiers, i.e. the management committees, to carry out, the council is carrying out the main um, wind and water type repairs and the regular maintenance. So therefore, if you weigh up what they've been given in a, a lease model such as this, compared to simply giving them ownership of a building where they would become responsible for um, all the building costs, where they may not have a development grant and such like, they've actually got quite a good deal. So therefore, with regards to taking on full ownership, it does make sense for the, the groups to lease the buildings and then um, get a, a more resources for running their activities. I'd like to go back a little bit and explain um, how, why um, the council came to this decision regarding transferring the community centres. So if we could move on to the, the next slide, please, Phil. 
the council had um, had historically two types of community centres. Um, if people have worked in Aberdeen or been in the communities in Aberdeen over the last maybe 10 to 12 years, they might remember staff and some community members referring to community centres as ex-regional council or ex-GRC buildings and ex-district or ex-district council buildings. This is because historically we had community um, learning or community education as it was at its time operated community centres and then the district council had um, community centres which had local management committees and ran primarily recreational activities um, and these were the district council buildings. With local government reorganisation back in 1996, I believe it was, all these centres became under the, the one council of Aberdeen City Council. However, I think the, the mindset of people to differentiate the two types of centres, we refer to them as ex-region and ex-district um, centres. More recently, um, we started to use the term lease centres to refer to the ones that had been operated by the district council. I think it was moving away from the history of regional and district councils and recognising we had one council. And the politicians within the council decided that it would be good to empower the communities and all the community centres to have them all operate on this lease model where local management committees were operating the community centres. This was decided, um, I think it's approximately 18 months ago now, and we've been working to try and ensure that all the centres are operating in this model. However, it wasn't just as quite as clear cut as saying we'll take all the buildings that we got that are operated by the council and hand them over to community groups. Um, there was um, a lot of work required to clarify the roles as to what was happening between council and then um, community members. So we had to actually make sure that everything was clear both to community and officer level but also on a, a legal level because there had been issues in the past where I can remember maybe five or six years ago for instance um, there was a member of staff who had a, an issue at work and it was only then that they actually realised they weren't working for the council, they were actually working for an independent organisation. Now those types of issues are, are unfortunate and while they may have happened in the past, if we want to make sure that we do this correctly, we have to make sure everything is um, above board and, and understood by everybody. One thing that's happened recently um, is that through the process of trying to transfer the, the centres to the lease centre model, it became clear that some of the buildings and, and some of the management groups, it just really wasn't relevant for them to be um, standalone lease community centres. These were primarily the um, community centre wings of the three R's buildings, the three R's buildings being buildings that are actually owned by um, a private company and leased back to the council. Primarily we couldn't lease the buildings to community groups if we didn't actually own the buildings and, and have the authority to do it, so that was problematic from a, a legal point of view. There were also lots of issues arising regarding janitorial cover and, and developing programmes within those buildings and some of these issues were also shared within um, council community wings into council owned schools where there were janitorial issues and the difficulty of ensuring the security and safety of um, school children at school at the same time have a, an openness of a, a community centre in the evening and at other times. Therefore the decision was taken that these buildings would retain within the ownership of the council and management of the council, but that we'd work with local management committees to ensure that they could de um, deliver the programme of activities that they wanted to deliver from these buildings. However, the overall responsibility of the programme will remain within the council, as will the full maintenance and repair of the building, health and safety issues of the building and such like. One of the things, as I said, that came out of this was the, the need to develop a robust um, legal framework between the management committees and um, the council. So we have developed a, a more robust lease um, which details the building responsibilities between the council and the management committee. And what I consider to be more important is a management agreement which in essence details the resources that each side brings to the table. So we have uh, detail all the resources and the expectations of the City Council and at the same time what we expect um, from working in partnership with the, the management committees and that's as I said through the Lease and Management Committee. If you could move on to the next slide Phil please. 
So the, the question we would actually ask is this certainly on paper is about empowering communities. We've um, given a large asset to the communities um, in order to carry out their activities. Some of them we've effectively handed over um, in, in total and others we've retained the asset but we've allowed the, the management committees to run their activities from it. So as I said before, this certainly on the, on the surface of it um, is community empowerment. We're, we're certainly encouraging and handing over these assets to the community. However, I don't think that it's the community necessarily has always felt that this has been um, community empowerment. Um, from both types of groups there have been difficulties um, for instance, the existing at least community centres who were used to running their centres independently of the council um, found that the new documentation, the new lease and the new management agreement was seemed to be taking away control from themselves um, and also with regards to clarifying um, positions with regard to repairs and such like that there may actually have been less resource being placed on the, the table from the council. So there was a, a bit of resistance and feeling that there wasn't community empowerment from some of the existing groups. Similarly, some of the groups that had um, been operated as um, council uh, managed buildings felt that they were now being asked to manage a building that the council had previously managed and didn't necessarily feel that they were being empowered to do this simply that they were carrying out the duties that the council had previously done and therefore it was a, a bit daunting potentially um, frightening and such like so we have a, a whole process that's tried to empower communities and there has been the feeling within some of the communities that as opposed to being empowering it's actually perhaps removed some of the empowerment either by reducing um, resources or placing on more obligations or by simply giving a resource that had previously been managed by the council. The other thing to be aware from community empowerment angle is that we could by empowering one organisation and, and assisting one organisation if it doesn't represent the wider community there is potentially it's not empowering communities it might just be empowering particular members of a community and I think that's one of the reasons why we've had to develop the management agreement is to ensure that the management committees that we're working with are actually aware of their responsibilities of um, you know, finding out the needs of their um, local communities and responding to those. Um, but on the whole, it's been a, a process where, although we are trying to empower communities, it doesn't necessarily um, come across that way when the, the communities are passionate about the, the community centres that they operate in. If you could move on to the next slide, please, Phil. Well, what can we do and, and what have I been doing with regards to trying to ensure that the community groups operate in the, the community centres are empowered? Uh, one of the things which I think is vitally important and has perhaps um, been lacking in the last few years, and when the last few years I don't mean recently, I'm talking about maybe 20 um, years, 15 years ago, is support and challenge. Um, one of the things is these um, community centre management committees, particularly the ones that have been operating for a long time, are passionate about what they do. They try to do the best for their communities. Excuse me a second. Sorry, I've got a tail end of a cold. Um, these management committees are passionate. Um, they're trying to serve their local communities. However, the resources that uh, the local authorities put in and direct support for the management committees hasn't been uh, as high as could have been. There, there hasn't been dedicated officers providing a, a support role um, for a number of years and it's only recently that my post was um, created within the council. As well as the support to actually help these community centre management committees with the, any issues that arise, there also I believe needs to be challenge. Um, challenge shouldn't be looked at being confrontational or negative. Challenge is really about an external pair of eyes, an external pair of ears going in and finding out what issues are affecting a community centre, community centre management co committee and what changes maybe could take place to make their, effect, their impact on the community and their effectiveness even better. And if you don't have this support and challenge together, then it is quite um, d difficult for um, management committees to deliver the best they can. So they need to be supported and highlighted the, the 
but areas of work that they're doing well, but at the same time being challenged um, um, in a diplomatic way, but being challenged um, where they could be doing things better. One of the ways we hope to address that, as I've mentioned before, is through the, the legal documents. Now, one of the things I have found is these legal documents of the lease and management agreement have been quite frightening um, to the community uh, members on the management committees. They are obviously um, used as legal language. It's not the normal language that um, we would commonly use in, in spoken word or written word. And there has been much discussion over whether the word may or should or such like should be used instead. It gets down to that nitty gritty level. So in order to assist the management committees with this, we actually provided resources so that they could um, employ an independent solicitor to act uh, as a collective on their behalf because um, when we are dealing with legal matters it is it's paramount that people have access to independent legal advice but now we've, we've got to stage where I believe these have all been uh, agreed the both the lease and management agreement but it's quite good that these are actually a way for that support by making matters extremely clear um, and by challenging whereas if people are aware of should we be doing this, should we not. It's now, as it were, in black and white so that people can see that what's expected from them. However, I think just using legal documents isn't particularly very friendly or, or that helpful for the community group. So what we've developed and um, we'll be rolling out on an annual basis is a, a process we've called a health check. Now this health check is really, it's a questionnaire, but it's more of a memory aid for myself or whatever officer is carrying out the health check to work through um, with the, the community management groups with regards to how well is your organisation actually um, working, um, how well is the building being managed, um, what are your obligations within the lease and management agreement, are you fully aware of them, and uh, if not, Sort of which bits are you not aware of? Um, are you've, have you got any issues with your finance or other operational matters? Are there any legal issues specific to the activities you provide? For instance, some centres uh, might provide childcare. They'll have legal issues with regards to childcare. Some may be providing hot food and they may have legal issues with regards to hot food and such like. And then rather than um, having a way of saying you must make sure that you have this certificate, you must make sure that you're carrying out um, these checks, is to actually develop an action plan where we can identify where the support is needed for the management committees and then bring the appropriate agency or officer in to offer that assistance. Um, and it's been based upon actually a, a process of fire risk assessments where um, we would have an officer going around a building highlighting where there are potential issues with regards to fire safety and then developing an action plan. This is effectively an organisational um, process where they would identify um, support issues and um, we then develop an action plan in conjunction with the management committee regarding that. The, the last thing in the, this slide is regarding um, local accountability. Um, one of the things we have to make sure is that these management committees are actually responding to um, local needs. Um, I think some of the people on the management committees thought that the council with the legal documents were trying to perhaps take control of the community centres and run them the way the council would run them. I don't think that's the, the role of the council. I think the council has to ensure that the community centres have been operated you know, de um, democratically and in response to local need. So we have a monitoring role and an overseeing role as opposed to a controlling role. Ultimately, if we're about community empowerment, we have to make sure that the wider community is in control of um, what happens in the community centres. So we do have a, a role there with um, regards to that. I'm aware that some questions are coming up and I, I think I might take this question just now because uh, there is a comment about um, perhaps people who shout the loudest can get what they want within community centres. Um, for instance, um, younger people might need to use a centre, but older people are running the centres and perhaps they could um, um, pull in, they, they could make more draw on the, the resources there. As I was saying, one of the things we have to ensure as a council is about local accountability. So if the local needs of the community are that, for instance, we need youth facilities taking place rather than adult facilities, we have um, developed um, learning partnerships in all of the areas and um, what would happen is the management committees have an automatic right to be part of that 
um, learning partnership, but learning partnerships should be identifying um, what a need, what what the needs are locally. So it might be a case of no more youth provision, and if it, the management committees weren't responding to that, then through the health check, we would really be challenging that by saying no why. They may very well have other information regarding why they're addressing adult needs rather than children's needs, but there is a a case of the whole health check and process within the council is to ensure there is local accountability. There's always um, two sides to every story within communities, so it is a case of um, having a wider um, involvement in the management committee and other agencies to decide what happens locally. But if we are handing on an asset to a community group to manage it, we have to support them in the, the first place to um, not run it in the way they want to run it. If we move on to the, the next slide, please, Phil. So one of the things is how can we maximise the benefits of um, you know, this independent model? One of the things that's, I think it's fairly straightforward is we need to encourage the good practice that does take place there within centres. Um, I've been around most of the least community centres um, in the, the last year and there is good practice taking place in all of the centres. They are actually generally um, trying to run the, the centres as, as well and as best as they can and I think that has to be recognised that there is a lot of hard work coming in from the, the community members with regards to it. However, I could probably in the same vein find stuff wrong in every community centre, the same as I'm sure everybody would be able to do that in any walk of life. Um, but I think that rather than trying to um, address that in a negative way, we need to build upon the positive bits and actually get the management committees themselves to see where they could improve their practice to remove poor practice where it exists. Because I, I do think most of the management committees are committed to delivering a good quality local service. And I think it's much better to try and do that in a more positive partnership approach than it would be in a, a confrontational approach. Which brings me on to the last point here, and, and this is something that's probably quite difficult for local authority staff and, and council staff to, to deal with. Um, we've been establishing these independent organisations to run the centres um, independently of the council, and really we have to recognise that that's independent means independent, where the council can't control the, the management of these centres. We are giving up control by establishing management committees. Now that's not to say that the management committees shouldn't be answerable to their local communities through the council, but we do have to realise that what we need to do is support the committees to be independent rather than attempt to control them and, and get them to do the things the way the council would do them. Because we aren't establishing small councils across the city, we're actually establishing independent organisations which we're trying to ensure can operate and respond to local need and we, we need to recognise that there's only so much we can actually do directly that what we have to do is encourage um, the management committees to, to work in a, an empowering way themselves. And if we could move on to the next slide please Phil. Um, the last sort of part of it is um, what would be change um, I think if people have been looking at the, the press and such like recently, which I'll give you an idea, there's been you know, headlines here which says volunteers' anger erupts as future centres debated and, and such like. There's a, been a lot of um, you know, negative press recently is, is how I would put it across. So it's, it's been a rough journey um, that we've taken here. However, one of the things that I would like to, to change if we could do is it's uh, the views of both the community and staff. I think um, there's there's been a, a point of view that's been picked up such as that the community fear that they're either being imposed upon by the council or that the council is removing something that was previously there and that their view is that the, the council isn't necessarily a, a partner, it's almost like a um, I think it was once described by one of the community members as a, a master-slave approach. Um, really, it wasn't an equal partnership. So I think that perception, if we could have changed that, if we could have, have got a, 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 a way of developing the, the work that's going on without having those impressions come across, that would have been ideal. 
and similarly, I think that you know, the staff have been viewing the fact that these management committees should be operating this maybe in a way that's that's similar to how councils operate. And I think once again, that would be a recognition that they're independent and that we can support them to do the things well independently. Um, and I think so the, the views that we've come with from history would be better if there was a change. The last thing that I would like to say is I think there's this question about need. One of the things I've, I've recognised in previous work is that developments and um, community ownership and community empowerment work better when there's a, a need for that to take place. And I would question whether there was a perceived need with what's happened in the, the last couple of years. The, the least community centres were probably quite happy to continue as, as they were. So from their perspective, they probably didn't see a need for change. Similarly, the, the community members that use the council operated community centres were quite happy with the council to operate them and they probably didn't see a perceived need to, to change that either. Um, however, I think this was a, a perception rather than a, a reality because, uh, as I said earlier on, the least community centres hadn't had a great deal of support and challenge over the a number of years beforehand and really that that had to change and um, there were um, decisions regarding budgets and such like which meant that community centres were not in a situation where they could continue as they were so there was actually a need it's just that nobody had uh, within the communities had perceived the need for the change and one of the community enterprises for instance that I've worked with many years ago had initially received um, for, well, two community centres they both received funding from Urban Aid as it was at the time. Both of them wanted to do childcare but at the last minute one of them was encouraged to do teleworking instead. Um, the, the bottom line was that the teleworking one there was, wasn't really a, a need locally, there wasn't that much of an interest locally and lo and behold when the, the funding ran out the organisation had to wind up and cease to be. The other organisation did continue with childcare they stopped mainstream funding from the council probably about 10 years ago. They have recently obtained some funding, I think, from National Lottery to develop a baby unit. But the bottom line with that um, community, um, community facility is that it's still ongoing, still provides childcare in a regeneration area, and it's still been very successful. And that was because there was a need for what they were doing, whereas the teleworking, there wasn't really a need. So that ideal situation, uh, if we had to go back to the beginning and, and could start with a, a fresh slate. Um, so if you could move on to the next slide, Phil. I, I hasten to say that the reason close all community centres is in red is I'm not proposing it as a, as a, a, a position to take forward or such like. But an ideal situation would be if we had no community centres, if we closed all the community centres in the city, then what we would actually have done is the local communities would have realised that there was a need for something there and they would have actually worked to you know, help develop that. So main, mainly what that would do is remove any preconceptions and history that um, affected any of the communities. We could start with a, a fresh slate. In that case, what you'd find is that the communities would be able to identify what was actually required, what activities should take place, what the building requirements were, and they'd effectively be working to just meet local needs. They wouldn't be worrying about whether uh, a little resource had been lost in these you know, harsh economic times or whether the management structure was slightly different or whether the legal documents wordings weren't quite the way they liked it. They would actually realise there was a need for a community facility within the community and they'd hopefully be working with the council to deliver on that. Um, so my key points from um, this little talk is really what the way I approached it, which if you could move on to the next slide, Phil, is I think that there needs to be honesty and respect for everybody involved. When it became clear that the legal negotiations were going to take quite a time, I deliberately um, made it clear to both the community members and to management staff that my role wasn't to be directly involved in those negotiations, but was to work with the 
community groups with whatever was finally agreed. The reason being I want to work with the, the management committees in a, a positive way to support and challenge what's happening and felt that if I came with the baggage of having been involved in the negotiations that that would be more difficult. And I think what I've tried to do throughout this process is be honest to all sides, whether that be community or staff, and respect their points of view. Whether or not I agree with them is really irrelevant. I'm there to, to support, whether it be my management staff or support the communities, and act as a, the link person um, between the communities and the council. The other thing I think that's a, a key point for community ownership, community empowerment, and asset transfers is really the councils and council staff have to realise that they are have to relinquish control. Um, you can't pass an asset or empower a community and then expect them to do what you want them to do. Um, it's counterintuitive um, regarding that. So if we're handing an asset over to the community, then we're relinquishing control of that asset. If we're trying to empower a community, then we have to be aware that that community might not think the same way we do. That can be quite frightening for staff, but it's um, probably quite healthy as well. And I think if you work and respect the community's views, it won't be as difficult as people believe. Which brings the next point, which is, I think if we recognise that most, if not all of the community management community groups across the city have got the same goals or similar goals to the council, therefore, by working to support their goals, we should ultimately be meeting our own goals. And the, the last point is everybody needs to be realistic. And we are in a different economic climate now than we were three, four years ago. Um, there's a lot less resource going round. And um, I think everybody has to realise that means, as I think some of the more senior politicians in the country are saying, we're all in it together. So that means to say that things can't continue exactly as they've been, um, been, been in the last 10, 20 years. There will have to be change. So um, uh, the last slide is just some links to give some people some background information. I felt it might be breaking copyright to scan some newspaper headings and such like. But really, this is just to give you a flavour of some of um, the stuff that has come up um, to show that the, some of the management committees have been quite empowered um, over the process by having the strength to go and, and try to tackle the council's decisions um, you know, face to face and such like, by using the press and such like. I've tried to counter that by showing the, you know, the press releases that we've issued with regards to it, but there has been a campaign from some of the centres um, through Facebook and, and such like. But it's good to say now that we are um, moving forward and I believe that the, the legal issues with regards to the lease management agreement have now been resolved so that we will be in the, in the coming months and coming years actually working together to um, develop the community centres to make sure they respond to local needs. Um, so that's the, the end of my presentation. I'll try and take the questions now, although the, I've got to admit it's a bit difficult to talk and read at the same time, particularly when I don't have my glasses on, so I might put them back on. <laughs> so um, I'll try and figure out how these questions go. Okay, Alan, yeah, we've got some questions just there for you that have popped into the chat window. The first one that says another comment for you, that's from um, um, Katie McLean, and we've got a response from Dave. And so if you'd like to read the first one, um, that'll take you up to, if you see at all, and then the, re and the response, yeah, the, the response is from Dave. Right. If you'd like me to read them, I can do. Well, it's the first one uh, about community empowerment coming from community consultation and not um, local authorities and others deciding themselves that communities should have ownership of their centres. Um, is that the, the first one, yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Right. So I'll just read the question out. It's, um, I feel community empowerment comes from community consultation, not local authorities and others deciding themselves that a community should have ownership of the centre. Such top-down delivery brings more challenge than it solves, except for saving public money and rates, etc. And Highland Culture and Sport has become a charity which is great in some ways. Buildings are leased back from the council retain um, care and repair contracts, but they have to find um, new ways of generating income, and I worry that, uh, that the unfit or the unfit will end up subsidising the fit and that culture gets no funding at all. 
I mean, the, uh, the ideal situation, I suppose, would be that um, any transfer would take place with full consultation with communities and such like. I wasn't necessarily saying that the, the whole way was um, an empowering process and that, that necessarily the communities wanted this. That's why I said the perception is there was no need. But the, the decision was made to do this. And if you look at what has been, as it were, handed to the management committees, they are empowered to operate their community centres in the way that they wish to, to operate them. It may not be the ideal situation, but it's what we as staff and the communities had to, to deal with. Um, I mean, it was a political decision to have the community centres managed in that way. And um, certainly our role as um, staff is to try and carry that out as best as we can. But I don't think it should be carried out in a way where the communities don't have any influence on it. And I think by having the, the management committees made up of community members is as, as empowering as we can in the, the situation. I don't know if that answers the, the question or not. <laughs> I think it probably does and you've got a response there from Dave Valentine oh, right. just saying to the above comment yes perhaps it would be better if the possibility of a lease was created but then leave it to each community to take on if and when they want to as part of the locally generated and led community empowerment process. The, there has been a, a slight change as well with regards to the, the lease and management agreement the last committee which I think was the 22nd of November there had been some of the uh, management committees saying that they felt the responsibility of doing certain repairs in the community centres was more than they wanted to and the committee agreed that they could every uh, management committee could if it wished to um, be treated like the the school management committees whereas the council retains responsibility for the building and the health and safety and, and related aspects and the management committee then delivers its programme as part of a, a wider council's programme. Um, so there is, I suppose from that sense, there is a case of here's what you can sign up to. Um, you can either choose to sign up to it or not, but that you can't continue to operate as you've operated with um, no lease or management agreement in place and expect the, I suppose all the benefits of the, the lease and management committee without, um, sorry, lease and management agreement without signing up to it. So there is this um, two way option now that all the community centres have. Um, we've got another message coming in from Larder saying, are all members of the management committee's volunteers from the local community? They should be. <laughs> um, without going through every constitution and checking every member, then I, I wouldn't be able to give a 100% accurate response to that. Um, if she's referring to are people employed or not, then the management committee is drawn up from a, a membership clause, which is primarily local people. Um, I think some of the centres, it really depends on how you would draw local. It could be, for instance, like uh, we're, we're based out at universities now, so for instance, the local community could be Seton, but it might be Aberdeen could be the local community. So most of the management committee would be drawn from the local community in that sense. There is also some of the um, management committees employ staff and it is possible in some of the management committees that the staff um, that are employed potentially could be management committee members as well. My own recommendation and advice to all management committees is you avoid that if at all possible. It leaves you open to all sorts of allegations um, of wrongdoing, whether or not there's any wrongdoing there or not, I'm not saying there is, but it leaves you open to those allegations. To me, the best option would be that the management committee are entirely made up of volunteers and that paid staff do not come on the management committee. Um, one of the, we've been working with partners and one of them is um, Aberdeen Council for Voluntary Organisations and they've been working with some of the new management committees. Um, they have put clauses within their constitution, the, the model one that they're suggesting that uh, management committees use, which means that if there is any member of staff who is also a management committee member, they're, they're basically they would have to exclude themselves from various parts of management of the building in order to make sure that there was um, appropriate safeguards for any wrongdoing taking place. But I'm one of these people that likes things to be very simple and the simplest thing is don't get involved in the management committee if you're a member of staff because it's so much cleaner. But the the council has not demanded that that happen. The council has said there just needs to be appropriate safeguards in place. But generally, most of the management committees are drawn from the local community. 
Okay, thank you, Ellen. We've got another message from Katie McLean just saying, are the community centres managed by people with a sports background? Galleries, libraries, literacies, budgets have lost out to sport here and the L in CLND is being lost. They... Sorry. I'll post that question oh, but... to you. Right, I was reading it and thinking that's not... Sorry, uh, bear with me. It, repeat it again then, please. <laughs> Yeah, I've just posted it all oh, for right. you. Yeah, no, the, I'm not aware of people having a, a sports background on any of the, the management committees. I mean, to be honest, most of the management committee members are just local people whose background can be very varied. I'm not aware of any of them having a, a sports background, nor of having a background in the arts or cultures either. Excuse me. Um, there have been issues with regards to learning taking place and concerns that um, community learning and development because we are no longer managing the, the centres that learning could could lose out to recreation. Um, a lot of the least community centres are already providing learning classes as well, but the, by retaining the community wings that are parts of the schools, we're calling them learning centres, then that means to say that community learning and development service will still have locations to deliver learning in local communities if it's required. Because overall, in the learning centres, the council will retain responsibility for the programme, whereas in the independent community centres, it will be the management committees that are responsible for the programme. Okay, we, we have a question from Karen, um, that's actually on the group chat list. Um, what has happened to the functions of community capacity building and youth work, which traditionally were run from the community centres, from in the community centres? The youth work team in the, there is still a youth work team in the council, it's part of the council's communities team. Um, I don't have a great deal of detail with regards to everything they're doing everywhere, but I'll give you an example from the community centre where I'm based. The community centre, the youth work team, the council basically asked to provide youth work locally within the, the building and the management committee within that building are granting the youth work team access free of charge to basically carry out youth work activity on a, a Tuesday evening as it is there. Now that is happening, I believe, elsewhere in other community facilities across the city as well. There may also be other youth work that the management committees deliver themselves that aren't been delivered as part of a council service. And there are similar activities taking place with regards to childcare, where the council is delivering childcare within um, managed, you know, at least community centres that are managed by management committees. So youth work is still taking place. I believe like a lot of the services, it's possibly with a, a lower budget than previous years. And, and the same as there's an adult learning team, and that's in essence, I believe, how they operate as well. They deliver classes, but they don't need to manage or own a community centre in order to deliver learning. They need to have access to a location to do it. And if that's what I'm saying, if we work in partnership with the management committees, most of them, if not all of them, don't have any objection to us coming in and utilising space to deliver classes or, or services for their local communities. So I hope that answers that question. <laughs> oh, the function of capacity building officers. The council does have um, six capacity building officers that work across the, the city and they have actually been working with the management committees of the communities are a lot of the times it's about working with the management committees of the community centres who were operated by the council and will be transferring to the police centre model and they're also responsibility for supporting the learning partnerships so there is still capacity building going on within the, the city as well. Okay thank you Ellen. We've got the next question from Kath Finlay. She says, do you have an equalities breakdown of the people who sit on the committees? Just wondered if there was a mix of gender, age, um, black and ethnic minority uh, communities etc. I don't have a breakdown um, of the equalities mix of the community centres. I do know we've published a community centre handbook and it is part of the the health check that I was speaking about, equalities is included within it and it's part of the conversation and discussion and effectively this was the monitoring that we have to do with the, the management committees is if 
there's a, an issue that they've maybe not considered yet regarding equalities that we will highlight it and challenge them if we think it's it's failing in some way. I think there's a potential there's some communities where there is maybe a high Eastern um, European uh, makeup within the community and if the community centres operating out there aren't reflecting that then I think the first port call would be to have the conversation as to why not and what we as a and a partnership as the council and the management committee can do to address that. So there isn't one just now, but there should be challenged if it isn't actually responding to local need. This is about having the uh, being accountable to the local community. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, there's a comment from Dave Valentine coming through just saying that I hear Alan say that this was not an ideal situation, rather a response to cutbacks, so it shouldn't be branded as community empowerment. It would be better to provide community empowerment support separate from community centres and see how each community wants to use it. So it's good to make the best of this community centre situation, but don't call it community empowerment. I'm not saying that the decision was community empowerment. I'm saying that the establishing of management committees to run their centres is a part of community empowerment, which isn't the same as the, saying the initial decision was about empowering communities. I don't also think that the initial decision was made purely on a, a financial basis. I believe that there was a, with the administration and the council at that time, they had a desire to have, with the basically with the what was in the administration within the council at that time I think they had a desire to have more community involvement in the running of community centres and that was the way they saw it had been best been delivered so I don't think it was a decision made in, in budget savings I think it was made at the same time decisions were made in budget savings but I don't think that was the driving goal behind it at all Okay, you've got quite a few messages coming up here, Alan. Um, there's one from Lada just saying, um, what if there was no one in the community who volunteers who, who wanted to volunteer to be on to be on the management committee? Sorry, I read that wrong. Um, should I read that again? Well, that what, what if um, there was no one within the community who wanted to who be on the management committee? Yeah. So, in essence, you don't have a management committee to operate a, a community centre. Um, it's not happened yet, but I, I mean, my own gut feeling with regards to that is that's showing that nobody wants to run that community centre within a particular community, in which case that should have to go back to the council, as in councillors, to decide on what they would want to do with regards to that. I mean, if um, the council's made a decision that they want local people to operate and manage their local community centres, and we find there's nobody in a, a local community that wants to do that, then we'd have to go back and ask for direction. Okay, thank you. And there's a message from um, uh, Kate James. Um, actually, sorry, this is from Lada on behalf of Lada. Um, sorry, I've just I've just read that message to you. It's actually from Brian Robertson. Am I right that Alan said the council provides funding for legal advice to management committees? This is really important as it's volunteers with le a legal responsibility. We're not providing ongoing legal advice. We provided legal advice for the management committees with regards to the lease and management agreement because I think people, to be honest, what happened, I think, is people were all of a sudden being told and advised by council officers as, do you know you've got a legal responsibility with regards to and you can fill in your blanks here to take any matter and I think that was just a dawning although people have been doing this for 15 20 years a dawning that all of a sudden they were realizing they were legally responsible for matters that they weren't aware of before I think because nothing went wrong people were just sort of um, quite happy to go on and it was only I, I don't think much has changed in the way of legalities people were responsible for what they did before and they're responsible for what they do now the only difference is we started to highlight what it is that they're responsible for and therefore one of the things about clarifying that was through the, the legal documentation when it was quite clear that people were concerned about that we uh, basically provided funding to give them independent legal advice. Um, I don't think that will continue, um, but there will be certain times where they will need to seek independent legal advice. For instance, they might want to enter into a contract with a third party. It would be always good to seek legal advice before doing that. 
but it's not an ongoing um, advice that we're providing for them. Although we will still provide a, um, support, help and assistance, but that's not necessarily the same as legal advice. Okay, thank you, Alan. In response to the uh, question that Kath Finlay asked earlier about do you have an equalities breakdown of the people who sit on the committee, um, someone mentioned that that's a really good question because um, you have to account for ethnicities, etc., but independent committees don't. And Kath responded with, is there a possibility of the council gathering the equalities breakdown of the committees and encouraging people not to not represented on the committee committees to take part? Well, yes, as I've mentioned, the health check, if if we were sitting down having a health check with a group, and let's say it was um, um, in a, an area that had a, a high proportion of um, Eastern Europeans, which is, is possible within the city, and yet there was nobody represented from that group or they were underrepresented, what we would do with the health check is recognise, well, what are you doing for, for that part of your community? There's nothing happening within that part of the community. We might very well be that what we take out of that is that the local capacity building officer starts to do some work to you know, bring those sort of people onto the committee um, through the membership of the organisation because it might be that you, you get the sort of, I can't think of the, the term, but you get the situation where no one will use the community centre because they're not delivering any activity, no, nobody locally will use the centre because they're not delivering the activities that they want to use and because of that nobody gets involved in the community centre to develop the activities they want to use so you get this self-fulfilling prophecy but that's the whole idea about the, the health check is it's trying to tackle these issues in a supportive way then drawing up an action plan with regards to what can be done whether it's a management committee that have to maybe take on a particular action, the council that might have to take on a particular action or another organisation that needs to be asked to take on an action, it's about identifying the issues that the, that particular committee has and that community centre has and what can be done to address it and it's not going to be a situation where overnight will change the way things are operated and ensure they all work um, like a, a utopia, it's a case of working towards that and I think it'll be working towards that all the time It's because as people and management committees move out and new people come in we'll need to do this process again and that's why this health check is an annual process of trying to ensure that these management committees are responding to local need. Oh we've got a new comment and this is from um, Katie McLean. There is a dilemma. Sensors need bums on seats, but the hard to reach are sidelined. It's just a yeah. comment I didn't add into what's what's kind of already been said there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you could have a hundred people through a, a centre using it. it. Doesn't necessarily mean to say you're having any impact um, on your community because it might be a hundred people that could access those services elsewhere. I'll just see if anyone's got any other comments. No, we've got no more comments coming free just now. So, is there anything else you wanted to say, Alan, on that? Oh, sorry, I think Karen would like to ask a question. No, it's okay. Let's see if Alan's got anything else to say. No, I. Th I think I'm fine. I, I don't think there's anything else I want to add just now. <laughs> um, that, in that case, I'd like to thank you very much, Alan, for your input. It's really interesting and invigorating, and you handled the questions very well. Well done for that. And could well, I thank also you. thank Phil and Ramon for their input behind the scenes, because they've been fantastic too. And can I uh, remind you all to do the activities and to tune in next Monday again for our next uh, keynote, which is going to be very exciting again. So thank you very much. Right, thanks. Thank you. There is one more question. question Would you like to answer that? Well, I'd like to show me the question. I'll tell you whether I'd like to answer it. <laughs> Do you run the community skill training for members of the Community skill training for members of the Okay, I'm not sure whether... Community oh. Yeah, we, we ran as a council. I, I didn't run it myself. It was a capacity builders. We had a, um, we called it leader training, and that was a effectively commi um, committee skills training. It covered matters such as finance and uh, running manage, uh, management committees. It also covered things like health and safety as well. I am aware 
from just my involvement with some of the community centres that there are some operational things that could be improved within them. But once again, part of the health check is about how the organisation runs and making sure it runs um, in an open and democratic way and that the public can actually influence what happens on the the management committee as well where the the management agreement i can't remember the exact wording but for instance all the management committee meetings in the the centers have to be open to the public and in, in the same way that community council um meetings are that the minutes of these meetings have to be made publicly available in the community center and um, so there is a lot been done to um, try and make the management committees as open and accountable to the local communities as possible which is I'm sure most of the management committees would agree that that's the proper way to go. Okay thank you Ellen and just a final note Dave just says hi Ellen good to see you soldiering on in Aberdeen. <laughs> thank you David. <laughs> <laughs> okay and um, Kate, I can't find Pauline's comment, so if you want to post it for me, I could just ask that, add that to Ellen as a final question. Okay, that's not coming free, so... Thanks for answering the, uh, the Q&A session, Ellen, that was great. Right. And I think we'll wrap it up there.